Section six of the Crimson Circle by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter fourteen. Thalia is asked out. Mr. Marl had to pass through the bank premises, and he glanced along the two rows of desks without, however, catching a glimpse of the girl whose face he sought. Near the end of the counter was a small compartment, the occupant of which was shielded from observation by opaque glass windows. The door was ajar, and he caught just a flash of the figure and walked toward the door. A girl at a typewriter watched him curiously. Thalia Drummond looked up from her desk to see the big, smiling face of a man looking down at her. "'Busy, Miss Drummond?' "'Very,' she replied, but did not seem to resent his intrusion. "'Don't get much funnier, do you?' he asked. "'Not a lot.' Her dark eyes were surveying him appraisingly. "'What about a bit of dinner one of these nights, and a show to follow?' he asked. Her eyes took him in, from his dyed hair to his painfully varnished boots. "'You're a wicked old man,' she said calmly. "'But dinner is my favourite meal.' His grin broadened, and the fires of conquest flickered in his faded eyes. "'What about the moulin gris?' He suggested the restaurant, without doubting her acceptance, but her lips curled scornfully. "'Why not at Hooligan's Fish Parlour?' she asked. "'No, it's the Ritz-Carlton or nothing for me.' Mr. Marl was staggered, but pleased. "'You're a princess,' he beamed, "'and you shall have a royal feed. What about tonight?' She nodded. "'Meet me at my house in Marisburg Place, Bayswater Road.' Seven thirty. You'll find my name on the door. He paused, expecting her to demur, but to his surprise she nodded again. Goodbye, darling, said the bold Mr. Marl, and kissed the tips of his fat fingers. Shut the door, said the girl, and went on with her work. She was destined again to be interrupted. This time the visitor was a good-looking girl, whose forearms were gauntleted in shiny leather. It was the typist who had followed Mr. Marl's movements with such curiosity. Thalia leaned back in her chair as the newcomer carefully closed the door behind her and sat down. "'Well, McCroy, what's biting you?' she asked inelegantly. The words did not seem to harmonize with the delicate refinement of face, and not for the first time did Millie McCroy look at the girl wonderingly. "'Who's the old nut?' she asked. "'An admirer,' replied Thalia calmly. "'You do attract them, kid,' commented Millie McCroy, with some envy, and there was a little pause. "'Well,' asked Thalia, "'you haven't come here to discuss my amours, have you?' Millie smiled furtively. "'If amours is French for boys, I haven't,' she said. "'I've come to have a straight talk with you, Drummond.' "'Straight talks are meat and drink to me.' said Thalia Drummond. "'Do you remember the money that went out by registered post last Friday to the Sellinger Corporation?' Thalia nodded. "'Well, I suppose you know that they claim that when the package arrived it contained nothing but paper.' "'Is that so?' asked Thalia. "'Mr. Brabazon has said nothing to me about it.' And she returned the other's scrutinizing glance without faltering. "'I packed that money in the envelope,' said Millie McCroy, slowly. "'And you had it to check. "'There's only you and me in this business, Miss Drummond, "'and one of us pinched the money, and I'll swear it wasn't me.' "'Then it must be me,' said Thalia, with an innocent smile. "'Really, McCroy, that's a fairly serious accusation "'to make against an innocent female.' The admiration in Millie's eyes increased. "'You're a thorough bad, if ever there was one,' she said. "'Now look here, kid. Let's put all our cards on the table. A month ago, soon after you came to the bank, there was a hundred note missing from the foreign exchange desk.' "'Well?' asked Thalia, when she paused. "'Well, I happen to know that you had it, and that it was changed by you at Bilbury's in the Strand. I can tell you the number if you want to know.' Thalia swung round and looked at the other under lowered brows. 
"'What have we here?' she asked in mock consternation. "'A female sleuth! Heavens, I am indeed undone!' The extravagant mockery of it all took Milly aback. "'You've got ice in your brain,' she said. She leant forward and laid her hand on the girl's arm. "'There may be trouble over this selling her business, and you'll want all the friends you can get.' "'So will you, for the matter of that,' said Thalia coolly. "'You handled the money.' "'And you took it,' said the other, in a matter-of-fact tone. "'Don't let us have any argument about it, Drummond. If we stick together, there'll be no trouble at all. I can swear that the envelope was sealed in my presence, and that the money was there.' There was a dancing light of amusement in Thalia Drummond's eyes, and she laughed silently. "'All right.' she said, with a little shrug of her shoulders. Let it go at that. Now, I suppose, having saved me from ruin, you're going to ask me a favour. I'll set your mind at rest about the money. I took it because I had a good home for it. I need money frequently, and anyway, there have been lots of postal robberies lately. There was a long article in the paper about it the other day. Now go ahead. Millie McCroy, who had not a slight acquaintance with the criminal classes, stared at the girl in amazement. "'Your eyes all right,' she nodded. "'But you've got to cut out this cheap pilfering, otherwise you're liable to spoil a real big thing, and I can't afford to see it spoiled. If you want a share of big money, you've got to come in with people who are working big. Do you get that?' "'I get it,' said Thalia. "'And who are your collaborators?' Miss McCroy did not recognise the term, but answered discreetly, "'There's a gentleman I know.' "'Say man,' said Thalia. "'Gentleman always reminds me of a tailor's ad.' "'Well, a man, if you like,' said the patient Miss McCroy. "'He's a friend of mine, and he's been watching you for a week or two, and he thinks you're the kind of clever girl who might make a lot of money without trouble. I told him about the other affair, and he wants to see you.' "'Another admirer?' asked Thalia Drummond, with a lift of her perfect eyebrows, and McCroy's face darkened. "'There'll be none of that, you understand, Drummond,' she said decisively. "'This fellow and I are sort of engaged.' "'Heaven forbid,' said Thalia Drummond, piously, "'that I should come between two loving hearts.' "'And you needn't be sarcastic either,' said McCroy, redder still. "'I tell you that there's to be no lovey-dovey stuff in this.' It's real business, you understand? Thalia played with her paper knife. Presently, she asked, Suppose I don't want to come into your combination? Milly McCroy looked suspiciously at the girl. Come and have a bit of dinner after the bank closes, she said. Nothing but invitations to dinner, murmured Thalia, and the nimble-witted Milly McCroy jumped at the truth. The old boy asked you to dinner, did he? she demanded. "'Well, ain't that luck!' She whistled, and her eyes brightened. She was about to offer a confidence, but changed her mind. "'He's got loads of money out of money-lending. My dear, I can see you with a diamond necklace in a week or two. Thalia straightened herself and took up her pen. "'Pearls are my weakness,' she said. "'All right, McCroy, I'll see you tonight.' And she went on working. Milly McCroy lingered. "'Look here. You're not going to tell this gentleman what I said about my being engaged to him, are you?' "'There's Brab's bell,' said Thalia, rising and taking up her notebook as a buzzer sounded. "'No, I'm not going to discuss anything of the kind. I hate fairy stories, anyway.' Miss McCroy looked after the retreating figure of the girl with an expression which was not friendly. Mr. Brabazon was sitting at his desk when the girl came in and handed her a scaled envelope. "'Send this by hand,' he said. Thalia looked at the address and nodded, and then looked at Mr. Brabazon with a new interest. Truly, the Crimson Circle was recruited from many and various classes. Chapter 15 Thalia Joins the Gang Thalia Drummond was almost the last of the staff to leave the bank that night, and she stood on the steps looking idly from left to right as she pulled on her gloves. If she saw the man who was watching her from the opposite side of the road, she did not reveal the fact 
by so much as a glance. Presently her eyes lighted upon Millie, waiting a few yards up the street, and she walked toward her. "'You've been a long time, Drummond,' grumbled Miss McCroy. "'You mustn't keep my friend waiting, you know. He doesn't like it.' "'He'll get over that,' said Thalia. "'I do not run to timetable where men are concerned.' She fell in by Millie's side, and they walked a hundred yards along the busy thoroughfare before they turned into Reader Street. The restaurants in Reader Street have taken to themselves names which are designed to suggest the gaiety and epicurean wonders of Paris. Le Moulin Gris was a small, deep shop which, with the aid of numerous mirrors and the application of gold leaf, had managed to create an atmosphere of cramped splendour. The tables were set for dinner and empty, for it was two hours before the meal, and to the proprietors of the Moulin Gris such a function as afternoon tea was unknown. They went up a narrow stairway to another dining-room on the first floor, and a man who was seated at one of the tables rose briskly to meet them. He was a sleek, dark young man. His beautifully brilliantined hair was brushed back from his forehead, and he was dressed, if not in the height of fashion, at least in the height of the fashion which he favoured. A faint odour of l'origan, a soft large hand, a pair of bright, unwinking eyes, with the first impression which Thalia received. "'Sit down, sit down, Miss Drummond,' he said brightly. "'Waiter, bring that tea.' "'This is Thalia Drummond,' said Miss McCroy, unnecessarily, it seemed. "'We needn't be introduced,' laughed the young man. "'I've heard a lot about you, Miss Drummond. My name's Barnet.' "'Flush Barnet,' said Thalia, and he seemed surprised and not ill-pleased. "'You've heard of me, have you?' "'She's heard of everything,' said Miss McCroy, in resignation. "'And what's more,' she added significantly, "'she knows Marl, and is dining with him to-night.' Barnett looked sharply from one to the other, then back again at Millie McCroy. "'Have you told her anything?' he asked. There was a note of menace in his voice. "'You don't have to tell her anything,' said Miss McCroy, recklessly. "'She knows it all.' "'Did you tell her?' he repeated. "'About Marl? No, I thought you'd tell her that.' The waiter brought the tea at that moment, and there was a silence until he had gone. "'Now, I'm a plain-spoken man,' said Flush Barnett, "'and I'm going to tell you what I call you.' "'This sounds interesting,' said the girl, never taking her eyes from his face. "'I call you Thorough Bad Thalia. How's that? Good, eh?' said Mr. Barnett, leaning back in his chair and surveying her. Thorough bad Thalia. You're a naughty girl. I was in court the day old Froyant charged you with pinching. He shook his head waggishly. You're as full of information as last year's almanac, said Thalia Drummond coolly. I suppose you didn't bring me here to exchange compliments. No, I didn't, admitted Flush Barnett, and the jealous Miss McCroy recognized by certain signs the fascination that the girl was casting over her lover. I brought you here to talk business. We're all friends here, and we're all in the same old business. I want to tell you straight away that I'm not one of your little thieving cooks who lives from hand to mouth. He spoke very correctly, but aspirated his H's just a trifle heavily, Thalia duly remarked. I have people behind me who can find money to any amount if the job is good enough, and you're spoiling a good pitch, Thalia. "'Oh, I am, am I?' said Thalia. "'Admitting I am all you think I am, in what way do I spoil the pitch?' Mr. Barnett rolled his head from side to side with a smile. "'My dear girl,' he said with good-natured reproach, "'how long do you think you're going to last, taking money from envelopes and sending on old bits of paper, eh? If my friend Brabazon hadn't got the idea into his silly head that the fraud was worked in the post,' You'd have had the police in your office in no time. And when I say, my friend, Brabazon, I'm not being funny, see? Here he evidently thought he had said too much, though he found it very difficult indeed to leave the question of his friendship with the austere banker. Challenged, he might have said more, but Thalia offered no comment. Now I'm going to tell you something. He leant over the table and regulated his voice. 
Millie and me have been working Brabazon's bank for two months. There's a big lot of money to be got, but not out of the bank. Brabazon is a friend of mine, but it can be done through one of the clients, and the man with the biggest balance is Marl. Her lips curled for the second time that day. That's where you're wrong, she said quietly. Marl's balance wouldn't buy a row of beans. He stared at her incredulously, then looked at Millie McCroy with a frown. You told me that he had the best part of a hundred thousand. So he has, said the girl. He had it until today, replied Thalia. But this afternoon Mr. Brabazon went out. I think he went to the Bank of England, because the notes were all new. He sent for me, and I saw them stacked up on his desk. He told me he was closing Marl's account, and that he was not the kind of man he wanted as a client. Then he took the money, and called on Marl, I think, for when he came back just before the bank closed, he handed me Marl's cheque. "'I've settled that account, Miss Drummond,' he said. "'I don't think we'll be troubled with that blackguard again.' "'Did he know about Marl asking you out to dinner?' asked Milly, but the girl shook her head. Mr. Barnett said nothing. He was sitting back in his chair, fondling his chin, with a faraway look in his eyes. "'A big amount, was it?' he asked. Sixty-two thousand, replied the girl. And it is in his house, said Barnett, his face pink with excitement. Sixty-two thousand! Did you hear that, Milly? And you're dining with him tonight, said Flush Barnett, slowly and significantly. Now, what about it? She met his gaze without flinching. What about what? she asked. "'Here's the chance of a lifetime,' he said, husky with emotion. "'You're going to the house. You're not above stringing the old man along, are you, Thalia?' She was silent. "'I know the place,' said Flush Barnett. "'One of those quaint little houses in Kensington that cost a fortune to keep up. Marisburg Place, Bayswater Road.' "'I know the address pretty well,' said the girl. "'He keeps three men-servants,' said Flush Barnett. "'But they're usually out any night he happens to be entertaining a lady friend. "'Do you get me?' "'But he's not entertaining me in his house,' said the girl. "'What's the matter with a little bit of supper after the show, eh?' asked Barnett. "'Suppose he puts it up to you, and you say yes. "'There'll be no servants in the house when you get back.' That I'll take my oath. I've studied Marl. What do you expect me to do? Rob him? asked Thalia. Stick a gun under his nose and say, Deliver your pieces of eight? Don't be a fool, said Mr. Barnett, startled out of his pose of elegant gentleman. You have to do nothing but have your supper and come away. Keep him amused. Make him laugh. You needn't be frightened, because I'll be in the house soon after you. And if there's any trouble, I'll be on hand. The girl was playing with her teaspoon, her eyes fixed on the tablecloth. Suppose he doesn't send his servants away. You can bank on that, interrupted Mr. Barnett. Moses, there never was such a wonderful opportunity. Do you agree? Thalia shook her head. It is too big for me. Maybe you're right, and I'm likely to get into trouble. But it seems to me that petty pilfering is my long suit. Bah! said Barnett, in disgust. You're mad. Now's your time to make a harvest, my dear. You're not known to the police. You're not under the limelight like me. Are you going to do it? She dropped her eyes again to the cloth, and again fidgeted with her spoon nervously. All right, she said with a sudden shrug. I might as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb. Or for a good share of sixty thousand. As for a miserable couple of hundred, eh? said Barnett jovially, and beckoned the waiter. Thalia left the restaurant and turned homeward. She had to pass the bank, and it was not good policy, she thought, to hail a taxicab until she had left the neighbourhood, where Mr. Brabazon's grave eyes might observe her extravagance. She had turned into the stream of pedestrians that thronged Regent Street at this hour, 
when she felt a touch on her arm and turned. A young man was walking by her side, a good-looking, keen-faced young man who did not smile ingratiatingly as others had done who had nudged her arm in Regent Street, nor did he inquire if she were going the same way as he. Thalia! She turned quickly at the sound of the voice, and for a second her self-possession failed her. Mr. Beardmore, she faltered. Jack's face was flushed, and he was obviously embarrassed. I only wanted to speak to you for a moment. I've waited for a week for the opportunity, he said hurriedly. You knew I was at Brabazon's. Who told you? He hesitated. Inspector Parr, he said. And when he saw the smile curl on the girl's lips, he went on. Old Parr isn't a bad sort, really. He's never said another word against you, Thalia. Another, she quoted. But does it really matter? And now, Mr. Beardmore, I really must go. I have a very important engagement. But he held fast to her hand. Thalia, won't you tell me why you did it? He asked quietly. Who is behind you? She laughed. There is a reason for your keeping this extraordinary company, he went on, when she stopped him. What extraordinary company? she demanded. You've just come from a restaurant, he said. You have been there with a man called Flush Barnett, a notorious crook, and a man who has served a term of penal servitude. The woman with you was Millie McCroy, a confederate of his, who was concerned in the Darlington Cooperative Robbery, and has also served a term of imprisonment. At present she is engaged at Brabazon's bank. Well, said the girl again, surely you don't know the character of these people, urged Jack. And how do you know them? she asked calmly. Am I wrong in supposing that you were not alone in your vigil? Were you accompanied by the admirable Mr. Parr? I see you were. Why, you're almost a policeman yourself, Mr. Beardmore. Jack was staggered. Do you realize that it is Parr's duty to inform your employer that you keep that kind of company? he asked. For heaven's sake, Thalia, take a sane view of your position but she laughed. Heaven forbid that I should interfere with the duty of a responsible police officer, she said. But on the whole, I'd rather Mr. Parr didn't. That, at least, is a sign of grace. She smiled. Yes, I'd much rather he didn't. I don't mind the police speaking to me for my good, because it is only right and proper that they should try to lead the weak from their sinful ways. But an employer who attempts to reform an erring girl might be a bit of a nuisance, don't you think? In spite of himself, he laughed. Really, Thalia, you're much too clever for the kind of company you're keeping and for the kind of life you're drifting to, he added earnestly. I know I have no right to interfere, but perhaps I could help you. Particularly, he hesitated, if you've done something which places you in the power of these people. She put out her hand with a rare smile. Goodbye, she said sweetly, and left him feeling something of a fool. The girl walked quickly through Burlington Arcade to Piccadilly and entered a taxi. The block of mansions at which she alighted was situated in the Marleybone Road and was a distinct improvement on Lexington Street. The liveried porter took her up in the elevator to the third floor, and she let herself into a flat which was both prettily and expensively furnished. She pressed a bell, and it was answered by a staid, middle-aged woman. "'Martha,' she said, "'I shan't want any tea, thank you. Lay out my blue evening gown and telephone to Waltham's garage, and tell them that I shall want a car to be here at five minutes before half-past seven. Miss Drummond's wages from the bank were exactly four pounds a week. End of section 6
He took both her hands in his and led her into the little golden-white drawing-room. Lovely, he repeated in an almost hushed voice. I can tell you I was a little bit scared about taking you to the Ritz-Carlton. You don't mind my frankness, do you? Have a cigarette? He fumbled in the tail pocket of his dress coat, produced a large gold case, and opened it. You thought I'd turn up in one of Morn and Gillingsworth's six guinea models, eh? She laughed as she lit the cigarette. Well, I did, my dear. I've had a lot of unhappy experiences, explained Marl, as he seated himself heavily in an armchair. I've had em turn up in queer clothes, I can tell you. Do you make a practice of entertaining the young and the fair? Thalia had seated herself on the big padded fireguard and was looking down at him under her half-closed lids. Well, said Mr. Marl complacently, rubbing his hands, I'm not so old that I don't get some pleasure out of ladies' society, but you're stunning. He was a blond, red-faced man with suspiciously brown hair, suspiciously even teeth, and for this evening he had acquired a waist which seemed wholly unreal. "'We're going to dinner, and then we'll go on and see the boys and the girls at the Windsor Palace,' he said. "'And then,' he hesitated, "'what do you say to a little supper?' he asked. "'A little supper? I don't take supper,' said the girl. "'Well, you can pack a bit of fruit, I suppose,' suggested Mr. Marl. "'Where?' asked the girl steadily. "'Most of the restaurants are closed before the theatres are out, aren't they?' There's no reason why you shouldn't come back here. You're not a prude, my dear, are you? Not much, she confessed. I can see you home in my car, he said. I've got my own car, thank you, said the girl. And Mr. Marl's eyes opened. Then he began to laugh steadily at first, and his laughter ended in an asthmatical paroxysm. Presently he gasped, Oh, you wicked little devil! The evening was an interesting one for Thalia, more interesting by reason of the fact that she caught a glimpse of Mr. Flush Barnett in the hall of the hotel as she passed through. It was after the theatre was over and they were standing in the vestibule, waiting for the lift man to call their car, that Thalia showed some symptom of hesitation. But the eloquent Mr. Felix Marl overcame whatever reluctance she felt, and as the clock was striking the half-hour after eleven, she passed into the hall not failing to notice that Mr. Marl did not ring for his servants, but let himself in with his own latch-key. The supper was laid in a rose-panelled dining-room. "'I will help you, my dear,' said Mr. Marl. "'We won't bother about the servants.' But she shook her head. "'I can eat nothing, and I think I'll go home now,' she said. "'Wait, wait,' he begged. "'I want to have a little talk with you about your boss.' I can do you a lot of good in that firm. At the bank, Thalia. Who called you Thalia? My godfathers and godmothers, M or N, said Thalia, solemnly, and Mr. Marl squeaked his delight at her humour. He was passing behind her, ostensibly to reach one of the dishes which were set on the table, when he stooped and, had she not slipped from his grasp, would have kissed her. I think I'll go home, said Thalia. Rubbish! Mr. Marl was annoyed, and when Mr. Marl was annoyed, he forgot that he made any pretensions to gentle birth. Come and sit down. She looked at him long and thoughtfully, and then, turning suddenly, went to the door and turned the handle. It was locked. I think you had better open this door, Mr. Marl, she said quietly. I think not, chuckled Mr. Marl. Now, Thalia, be the dear, good little girl I thought you were. I should hate to dissipate any illusions you may have about my character, said Thalia, coolly. You'll open that door, please. Certainly. He ambled toward the door, feeling in his pocket, and before she could realize his intention, he had seized her in his arms. He was a powerful man, a head taller than she, and his big hands gripped her arms like steel clamps. "'Let me go,' said Thalia, steadily. She did not lose her nerve, nor show the least sign of fear. 
Suddenly he felt her tense muscles relax. He had conquered. With a quick intake of breath he released his hold of the sullen girl. "'Let me have some supper,' she said, and he beamed. "'Now, my dear, you are being the little girl I—' "'What's that?' The last was a squeak of terror. She had strolled slowly to the table and had taken up the brocade bag. He had watched her and thought she was seeking a handkerchief. Instead, she had produced a small, black, egg-shaped thing, and with a flick of her left hand had pulled out a small pin and dropped the pin onto the table. He knew what it was. He had dabbled in army supplies and had seen many mills bombs. "'Put it down! No, no, put the pin in, you young fool!' he whimpered. "'Don't worry,' she said coolly. "'I have a spare pin in my bag. Open that door.' His hand shook like a man with palsy as he fumbled at the keyhole. Then he turned and blinked at her. "'A mills bomb,' he mumbled and fell back an obese mass of quivering flesh against the delicate panelling. Slowly she nodded. "'A mills bomb,' she said softly, and went out, still gripping the lever of the deadly egg-like thing. He followed her to the door and slammed it after her, then went shakily up the stairs to his bedroom. Flush Barnett, standing in the shadow of a clothes-press, heard the click of locks and the snap of a bolt as Mr. Marl entered his room. The house was still. Through the thick door of Mr. Marl's bedroom, no sound came. There was no transom to the door, and the only evidence that there was somebody in his room was afforded by a fret of light in the ceiling of the passage, which came through a ventilator in the wall of the bedroom. During the war, this house had been used as an officer's convalescent home, and certain hygienic arrangements had been introduced, which were more useful than beautiful. Flush crept softly in his stockinged feet to the door and listened. He thought he heard the man talking to himself, and looked around for some means by which he could obtain a view of the room. There was a small oaken table in the corridor, and he placed this against the wall and mounted. His eyes came to the level of the ventilator, and he looked down upon Mr. Marl, pacing the room in his shirt-sleeves, obviously disturbed. Then Flush Barnett heard a sound just a faint hush-hush of feet on a carpet, and he slipped down, walked quickly along the corridor, passing the head of the stairs. The hall below was in darkness, but he felt rather than saw a figure on the stairway. Whether it was man or woman he could not say, and did not stop to discover. It might be one of the servants returning furtively. Servants did not always stay away when they were bidden. Flush passed to the farther end of the corridor, and from an angle in the wall watched. He saw nobody pass the head of the stairs, but there was no background. After a while he crept back again. There was nothing to be gained by forcing the door of Marl's bedroom, even if it were possible. He had had time to inspect the house at his leisure, and he had already decided upon investigating the little safe in the library, for Mr. Marl's own room had drawn blank. The investigation, which took two hours, and the employment of one of the best sets of tools in the profession, was not unprofitable. But did it not reveal the huge sum of money which he anticipated? He hesitated. The night was too far through to make an attempt on the bedroom, even if he had not already searched it from wall to wall. He folded his kit and slipped it into one pocket, his loot into another, and went upstairs again. There was no sound from Marl's room, but the light was still on. He tried to look through the keyhole, but the key was still there. The only inducement there was for him to enter the room was the possibility that the money was in the man's clothes. This likelihood was remote, he thought. Possibly Marl had taken it to some safe deposit, a contingency which Barnett had foreseen. He went slowly down the stairs, through the hall and the butler's pantry, to the side door, where he had left his boots, his overcoat, and his shiny silk hat, for he was in evening dress. Then he stole softly forth along the covered passageway, running by the side of the house. Here a door opened into the little forecourt of Marl's house. He reached the garden, and his hand was on the gate, when somebody touched him, and he spun round. "'I want you, Flush,' said a well-remembered voice. "'Inspector Parr, you may remember me.' "'Parr!' gasped the bewildered Barnett. 
and with an oath wrenched himself free and leapt through the gate, but the three policemen who were waiting for him were not so easy to dispose of, and they marched Flush Barnett to the nearest police station, a worried man. In the meantime, Parr conducted a search of his own. Accompanied by a detective, he made his way to the hall of the house and up the stairs. "'This is the only room occupied, apparently,' he said, and knocked at the door. There was no reply. "'Go along and see if you can rouse any of the servants,' said Parr. The man came back with the startling information that there were no servants in the house. "'There's somebody here,' said the old inspector, and flashing his lamp along the corridor, he saw the table, and with an agility remarkable in one of his age, he leapt up and peered through the ventilator. "'I can just see somebody asleep,' he said. "'Hi, wake up,' he called, but there was no reply. Hammering on the door did not produce any response. "'Go down and see if you can find a hatchet. We'll break open the door,' said Parr. "'I don't like this.' Hatchet there was none, but they found a hammer. "'Can you show a light, Mr. Parr?' asked the man, and the inspector flashed his lamp on the door. It was a white door, white except for the crimson circle affixed to a panel as by a rubber stamp. "'Break in the door,' said Parr, breathing heavily. For five minutes they smashed at a panel before they finally hammered it through, and the sleeper within gave no sign of consciousness. Parr reached his hand through the door, turned the key, and, by dint of stretching, found the bolt at the top. He slipped into the room. The light was still burning, and its rays fell across the man on the bed, who lay upon his back, a twisted smile on his face, most obviously dead. Chapter 17 The Blower of Bubbles It was long after midnight, and Derek Yale was sitting in his pretty little study. He lived in a flat overlooking the park. When the knock came to the door, and he rose to admit Inspector Parr. Parr related the incident of the evening. "'But why didn't you tell me?' asked Derek, a little reproachfully, and then laughed. "'I'm sorry,' he said. "'I always seem to be butting in on your affairs.' But how came the murderer to escape? You say you had had the house surrounded for two hours. Did the girl come out? Undoubtedly. She came out and drove home. And nobody else went in? I wouldn't like to swear that, said Pa. Whoever was in the house had probably arrived long before Marl returned from the theatre. I have since discovered that there was a way out through the garage at the back of the house. When I said the house was surrounded, that was an exaggeration. There was a way through the back garden which I did not know. I didn't even suspect there were gardens there. Undoubtedly he went through the garage door. Do you suspect the girl at all? Parr shook his head. But why were you surrounding Marl's house at all? asked Derek Yale seriously. The answer was as unexpected as it was sensational. "'Because Marl has been under police observation ever since he came back to London,' said Parr. "'In fact, ever since I discovered that he was the man who wrote the letter, the scrap of which I found, and which I compared last week with his writing, I asked him for the address of his tailor.' "'Marl?' said the other, incredulously. Inspector Parr nodded. "'I don't know what there was between old man Beardmore and Marl, or what brought him to the house.' I've been trying to reconstruct the scene. You may remember that when Marl came to the house on a visit, he was suddenly seized with a panic. I remember, nodded Yale. Jack Beardmore told me about it. Well? He refused to stay at the house, said he was going back to London, said Pa. As a matter of fact, he went no farther than Kingside, which is a station some eight or nine miles away. He sent his bag on to London and came back by road. He was probably the person whom the murderer saw in the wood that night. Now why had he come back, if he was so scared that he ran away in the first place? And why did he write that letter for delivery in the night, when he had every opportunity to tell James Beardmore by day when he was with him? There was a long silence. "'How was Marl killed?' asked Yale. The other shook his head. "'That's a mystery to me. The murderer could not possibly have entered the room.' I had an interview with Flush Barnett, as yet he knows nothing about the murder, and he admits he broke in for the purpose of burglary. 
He says he heard the sound of somebody moving about the house, and very naturally hid himself. He also says he heard a strange hissing sound, like air escaping from a pipe. Another remarkable clue was a round wet patch on the pillow, within a few inches of the dead man's hand. It was exactly circular. At first I thought it was a symbol of the crimson circle, until I discovered another patch on the counterpane. The doctor has not been able to diagnose the cause of death, but the motive is clear. According to his banker, I've just been talking to Brabazon on the telephone, he drew a large sum of money from the bank yesterday. In fact, Brabazon closed his account. They had a quarrel over something or other. The safe was, of course, opened by Flush Barnett, but there was no money found on him when he was searched at the police station. Curiously enough, we did discover several little oddments that Flush had picked up. Now, who took the money? Derrick Yale paced the floor, his hands behind him, his chin on his breast. Do you know anything of Brabazon? he asked. The other did not reply immediately. Only that he is a banker and does a lot of foreign work. Is he solvent? asked Derrick Yale, bluntly and the inspector raised his dull eyes slowly until they were on a level with the others. "'No,' he said. "'I don't mind telling you that we've had one or two complaints about his methods.' "'Were they good friends, Marl and Brabazon?' "'Fairly good,' was the hesitating reply. "'The impression I have from reports is that Marl had some hold over Brabazon.' "'And Brabazon was insolvent.' mused Derek Yale. And this afternoon, Marl closes his account. In what circumstances? Did he come to the bank? Briefly, the detective explained what had happened. It seemed that there was precious little that did happen at Brabazon's bank that he did not know. Derek Yale was beginning to respect this man, whom at first he had regarded, with a good-natured scorn, as a little stupid. I wonder if it would be possible for me to go to Marl's house tonight. I came to suggest that, said the other. In fact, I kept a cab waiting at the door with that idea. Derrick Yale did not speak during the journey to Bayswater, and it was not until he stood in the hall of the house in Marisburg Place that he broke the silence. We ought to find a small steel cylinder somewhere, he said slowly. The policeman standing on duty in the hall came forward and saluted the inspector. We found an iron bottle in the garage, sir he said. Ah! cried Derrick Yale, triumphantly. I thought so. He almost ran up the stairs ahead of the detective, and paused in the passage, which was now lighted. The little oak table stood against the ventilator, and toward that he moved. Then he went down on his hands and knees, and sniffed the carpet. Presently he choked and coughed, and got up, red in the face. Let me see that cylinder, he said. They brought it to him. The policeman's description of it as a bottle was nearer the truth. It was an iron bottle, at the end of which was a small pipe, to which was attached a tiny turnkey. "'And now there ought to be a cup somewhere,' he said, looking round. "'Unless he brought it in a bottle.' "'There was a small glass bottle in the garage near this, sir,' said the policeman who had found it. "'It's broken, though.' "'Bring it to me, quickly,' said Yale. "'I can only hope but it isn't so completely smashed that none of its contents are left. The stout Mr. Parr was regarding him somberly. "'What is all this about?' he asked, and Derrick Yale chuckled. "'A new way of committing a murder, my dear Mr. Parr,' he said airily. "'Now let us go into the room.' The body of Marl lay on the bed, covered by a sheet, and the circular patch of wet on the pillow had not dried. The windows were open, and a fitful wind kept the curtains fluttering. "'Of course you can't smell it here,' said Yale, speaking to himself, and again went on his knees and nosed the carpet, and again he coughed and rose hurriedly. By this time they had returned with the lower half of a glass bottle. It contained a few drops of liquid, and this Yale poured into his hand. "'Soap and water,' he said. "'I thought it would be.' and now I'll explain how Mar was killed. Your thief, Flush Barnett, heard a hissing sound. It was the sound of a heavy gas escaping from this cylinder. 
I may be wrong, but I should imagine there is enough poison gas in that little iron bottle to settle your account and mine. It is still lying on the floor, by the way. It is one of those heavy gases which descend. But how did it kill Marl? Did they pump it through the grating onto his head? Derrick Yale shook his head. It is a much simpler and a much more deadly method which the Crimson Circle employed, he said quietly. They blew bubbles. Bubbles? Derrick Yale nodded. The end of this cylinder, you can still feel the slime of soap upon it, was first dipped into the soap solution, then thrust through the grating. The tap was turned down and a bubble formed, which was shaken off. From the ventilator, he ran outside and jumped onto the table. Yes, I thought so, he said. He could see Marl's head. Two or three of the bubbles must have been failures. One struck the pillow, but I should imagine that that was blown after his death. One struck the wall. He'll find the wet patch. But one, and probably more, burst on his face. He must have been killed almost instantaneously. Parr could only gape. I thought it all out on the way here. The circular patch on the pillow reminded me of my own boyish exploits, and their disastrous effect when I started blowing bubbles in the bedroom. And then when you mentioned the ventilator and the hissing noise, I was perfectly certain that my theory was right. But we smelt no gas when we came into the room, said Parr. The wind may have blown away the fumes, said Derrick Yale, but apart from that, the weight of the gas would send it to the floor, and by its own density it would spread evenly. Look. He struck a match, shielded it for a moment until it caught light, and then slowly brought it to the floor level. An inch from the carpet, the match was suddenly extinguished. I see, said Inspector Parr. Now, what about searching the place? Perhaps I can be of use, suggested Yale but his offer of help did not meet with any very gracious response. A small police audience, which had listened awe-stricken while Yale had developed his theory, could understand the inspector's feelings. Apparently, Yale did too, for with a good-humoured laugh he made his excuses and went home. There are moments when the headquarters police should be left alone with their own emotions. Nobody realised this more than Derek Yale. End of section 7。section 8 of the crimson circle by edgar wallace。this librivox recording is in the public domain。recording by anna simon。chapter 18 。flush barnett's story。inspector parr after a further search proceeded to the nearest police station to interview mr flush barnett。flush。a depressed and wary man, had no illuminating information to give. The proceeds of his robbery lay upon the station sergeant's table, a miscellaneous collection of rings and watches, a perfectly valueless bank-book, valueless to flush at any rate, and a silver flask. But the most surprising circumstance was that in Flush Barnett's pocket were two brand-new bank-notes for a hundred pounds, which he insisted stoutly were his own property. Now, burglars, and particularly the type of burglar that Flush Barnett was, are notoriously improvident people. They do not work whilst they have money, and with two hundred pounds in his possession, it is certain that Flush Barnett would not have attempted to break into Marisburg Place. "'They're my own, I tell you, Mr. Parr,' he protested. "'Would I tell you a lie?' "'Of course you would,' said Inspector Parr, without heat. "'If they are your own,' Where did you get them? They were given to me by a friend. Why did you light a fire in the library? asked Parr unexpectedly, and Flush Barnett started. Because I was cold, he said, after a pause. Hmm, said Inspector Parr, and then, as though speaking his thoughts aloud, he has two hundred of his own, he breaks into a house, he burgles a safe, and lights a fire. Now, why did he light the fire? Why did he light the fire? To burn something he'd found in the safe. Flush Barnett listened without offering any comment, but he was visibly distressed. Therefore, said Pa, you were paid to break into Marl's house, 
and you got two hundred for pinching something from his safe and burning it. Am I right? If I died this moment, began Flush Barnett. You'd go to hell, said the inspector dispassionately, where all liars go. Who's your pal, Barnett? You'd better tell me, because I'm in two minds whether I shall charge you with the murder. Murder? Almost screamed Flush Barnett as he sprang to his feet. What do you mean? I haven't committed a murder. Marl's dead, that's all. Found dead in his bed. He left the prisoner in a state of mental prostration, and when he returned in the early hours of the morning to renew his inquisition, Flush Barnett told him all. I don't know anything about crimson circles, Mr. Parr, he said, but this is the truth. He added a pious wish that Providence would deal hardly with him if he departed from veracity. I'm keeping company with a young lady at Brabazon's bank. One night when she was working late, I was waiting for her when a gentleman came out of the side entrance of the bank and called me. I was surprised to hear him mention my name, and I nearly dropped dead when I saw his face. It was Mr. Brabazon? suggested Pa. That's right, sir. He asked me into his private office. I thought he'd got something against Millie. Go on, said Pa, when the man paused. Well, I've got to save myself, haven't I? And I suppose I'd better speak the whole truth. He told me that Marl was blackmailing him, and that Marl had some letters of his, which he kept in his private safe, and offered me a thousand if I'd get them. That's the truth. And then he gave me an idea that Marl kept a lot of money in the house. He didn't exactly say so, but that is what he hinted. He knew I'd been inside for burglary. He'd made inquiries about me, and said that I was the right kind of man. Well, sir, I went round and took a squint at the place, and it seemed to me that it was a bit difficult. There were always men servants in the house, except when Mr. Marl was entertaining ladies to supper. He grinned. I'd have given up the job, only there's a young lady in the office that Marl was sweet on. Thalia Drummond? suggested Pa. That's right, sir, nodded Flush. It was what you might call an act of providence, him being sweet on her, and when I found that he'd invited her to dinner, I thought that was a good opportunity to get in. It seemed money for nothing when I found out that he'd drawn his bank balance. I opened the safe, that was easy, found the envelope, but it had no papers, only a photograph of a man and a woman on a rock. I think it was a photograph of some place abroad, for there were lots of mountains in the background and he seemed to be pushing her over, and she was holding on to a bit of tree. Maybe it was one of those cinema pictures. Anyway, I burnt it. I see, said Inspector Pa. And that is all? That's all, sir. I never found any money. At seven o'clock, with a warrant in his pocket, and accompanied by two detectives, Inspector Pa made a call at the block of flats where Brabazon had his residence. A servant in night attire opened the door to them and indicated the banker's room. The door was locked, but Parr kicked it open without ceremony. The room, however, was empty. An open window and a fire escape suggested the method by which the eminent banker had made his getaway, and the fact that the bed had not been slept in and that there was no sign of disorder in the room showed that he had gone hours before the detective's arrival. By the side of the bed there was a telephone and Parr called the exchange. "'Can you find if any message came through to this number during the night?' he asked. "'I'm Inspector Parr, of police headquarters.' Two, was the reply. "'I put them through myself. One from Bayswater.' "'That was mine,' said the inspector. "'What was the other?' "'From the Western Exchange, at two thirty. "'Thank you,' said the inspector, grimly, and hung up the telephone.' He looked at his companions and rubbed his big nose irritably. Thalia Drummond is going to get another job, he said. Chapter 19 Thalia Accepts an Offer It took over a week to settle the preliminaries of Brabazon's insolvency, and at the end of that time Thalia walked from the bank with a week's salary in her little leather bag and no immediate prospects of employment. Inspector Parr had not minced his words, which he had addressed to her, before an impressed audience. "'Only the fact that I saw you come out of Marl's house, and saw him close the door on you, saves you from a serious charge,' he said. "'If it had only saved me from a lecture also, I should have been pleased. 
said Thalia coolly. "'What do you make of her?' asked Parr, as the girl disappeared through the swing doors of the office. "'She rather puzzles me.' It was Derek Yale to whom he had addressed his question. "'And the more I think of her, the more I am puzzled. The woman McCroy says that she has been engaged in pilfering since she has been at the bank, but there is no proof of that. In fact, the only person who could supply the proof is our absent friend, Brabazon. Why didn't you call her as a witness in the prosecution of Barnett? It will be a case of Barnett's word against hers, said the detective, shaking his head. And the case against Barnett was so clear that I didn't want any further evidence than my own eyes. Yale was frowning thoughtfully. I wonder, he said, half to himself. What do you wonder? I wonder if this girl could give us a little more information about the Crimson Circle than we have at present. I'm half inclined to engage her. Parr muttered something under his breath. I know you think I'm mad, but really I have method in my madness. There's nothing to steal in my office. She would be under my eye all the time, and if she were in communication with the Circle, I should certainly know all about it. Besides, she interests me. Why did you shake hands with her? asked Parr curiously, and the other laughed. That's why she interests me. I wanted to get an impression, and the impression I had was of some dark, sinister force in the background of her life. That girl is not working independently. She has behind her... The Crimson Circle, suggested Pa, and there was the suggestion of a sneer in his tone. Very likely, said the other seriously. Anyway, I'm going to see her. He called at Thalia's flat that afternoon and her servant showed him into the pretty little drawing-room. A minute after, Thalia came in, and there was a smile in her fine eyes as she recognized her visitor. "'Well, Mr. Yale, have you come to give me a few words of warning?' "'Not exactly,' laughed Yale. "'I've come to offer you a job.' Her eyebrows rose. "'Do you want an assistant?' she asked ironically. "'Acting on the principle that to catch a thief you must employ a thief?' or have you views about my reformation? Several people want to reform me, she said. She sat down on the piano stool, her hands behind her, and he knew that she was mocking him. Why do you steal, Miss Drummond? Because it is my nature to, she said, without hesitation. Why should kleptomania be confined to the ruling classes? Do you get any satisfaction out of it? he demanded. I'm not asking out of idle curiosity, but as a student of human man and woman. She waved her hand round the apartment. I have the satisfaction of a very comfortable home, she said. I have a good servant, and I am not likely to starve. All these things are particularly satisfying to me. Now tell me about the job, Mr. Yale. Do you want me to be a policewoman? Not exactly, he smiled. But I want a secretary. "'somebody upon whom I can rely. "'My work is increasing at a tremendous rate. "'My correspondence is much more than I can cope with. "'I will add that there is little opportunity in my office "'for the exercise of your pet vice,' he added good-humouredly. "'And anyway, I'll take that risk.' "'She considered a moment, looking at him steadily. "'If you're willing to take the risk, so am I,' she said at last. "'Where is your office?' He gave her the address. I shall be with you at ten o'clock in the morning. Lock up your checkbook and clear away your loose change, she said. A remarkable girl, he thought, as he was going back to the city. He spoke no more than the truth when he had told Parr that she puzzled him, and yet he had met with every type of criminal, and probably knew more of criminal psychology than did Parr with all his experience. His mind strayed to Parr that unhappy individual whom he knew was in disgrace. How much longer would police headquarters tolerate him after this third failure to deal with the Crimson Circle, he wondered. Mr. Parr was thinking on the same lines that night. A brief official memo had awaited him on his arrival at headquarters, and he read it with a grimace of pain. And there was worse to follow, he guessed, and he had good reason for that fear. The next morning he was summoned to the house of Mr. Froyant, and found Derek Yale already there. For all their good relationship, 
the chase of the crimson circle had developed into a duel between these strangely different personalities it was an open secret in newspaper land that parr's impending ruin was due less to the unchecked villainies of the crimson circle than to the superhuman brilliancy of this unofficial rival to do him justice yale did his best to discredit this view but it was held Foyant, for all his meanness and his knowledge of yale's heavy fees had commissioned him immediately after he had received the warning his faith in the police had evaporated and he made no attempt to disguise his scepticism mr Foyant has decided to pay were the words which greeted the inspector eh of course i shall pay exploded mr Foyant. he had aged ten years in the past few days thought pa his face was white and thinner and he seemed to have shrunk within himself if police headquarters allow this dastardly association to threaten respectable citizens and cannot even protect their lives what else is there to be done but to pay my friend pindle has had a similar threat and he has paid i cannot stand the strain of this any longer he paced up and down the library floor like a man demented mr Froyant will pay said derrick yale slowly but this time i think the crimson circle have been just a little too venturesome what do you mean asked pa have you the letter sir demanded yale and Froyan pulled open a drawer savagely and slammed down the familiar card upon his blotting pad when did this arrive asked Parr as he took it up noting the crimson circle by this morning's post Parr read the words inscribed in the center we shall call for the money at the office of mr derrick yale at three thirty on friday afternoon the notes must not run in series if it is not there for us you will die the same night three times the inspector read the short message and then he sighed well that simplifies matters he said of course they will not call i think they will said yale quietly but i shall be prepared for them and i should like you to be on hand mr parr if there is one thing more certain than another said the inspector phlegmatically it is that i shall be on hand but i don't think they will come there i can't agree with you said yale whoever the central figure of the crimson circle is he or she does not lack courage and by the way he lowered his voice you will meet an old acquaintance at my office parr shot a quick suspicious glance at the detective and saw that he was mildly amused drummond he asked yale nodded you are engaging her she rather interests me and i fancy that she's going to be a real help in the solution of this mystery Froyan came in at that moment and the conversation was tactfully changed chapter twenty the key of river house it was arranged that Froyant should draw the necessary money from his bank on the Thursday morning to pay the demand, and that Yale should call for it and meet Parr at the former's office in ample time to make the necessary preparations for the visitor's reception. Mr. Parr's way to headquarters took him past the big house where Jack Beardmore was living in solitude. The events of the past few weeks had wrought an extraordinary change in the youth. From a boy he had suddenly become a man with all a man's balance and understanding he had inherited an enormous fortune but with its coming the incentive of life had for the most part fallen away he could never escape the memory of thalia drummond her face was before him sleeping or waking and though he called himself a fool and could as he did argue the matter to a logical conclusion the sum of all his reasoning faded before the image he carried in his heart between inspector parr and he had grown a curious friendship there was a time when he was near to hating the stout little man but his good sense had told him that however large a part sentiment had played in his own life and in the direction of his own actions it could have no place in a police officer's moral equipment the inspector stopped before the door of the house and was for passing on but obeying an impulse he walked slowly up the steps and rang the bell the footman who admitted him was one of the dozen servants who accentuated the emptiness of the mansion jack was in the dining-room pretending to be interested 
in a late breakfast. "'Come in, Mr. Parr,' he said, rising. "'I suppose you breakfasted hours ago. Is there anything new?' "'Nothing,' said Parr, "'except that Mr. Froyant has decided to pay.' "'He would,' said Jack contemptuously, and then, for the first time in a long while, he laughed. "'I shouldn't like to be the red or crimson circle or whatever it calls itself.' "'Why not?' asked Mr. Parr, with a little light of amusement in his eyes, but he could guess the answer. "'My poor father used to say that Froyant fretted over every cent that was taken from him, and never rested until he got it back. When Harvey's panic is over, he will go after the Crimson Circle, and will never leave it until every banknote he has handed to them is repaid.' "'Very likely,' agreed the inspector. "'But they aren't holding the money yet.' He told Jack the contents of the letter which Froyant had received that morning, and his young host was visibly astonished. "'They're taking a big risk, aren't they? It will be a clever man who got the better of Derrick Yale.' "'So I think,' said the inspector, crossing his legs comfortably. "'I must take my hat off to Yale. There are things about him that I admire tremendously.' "'His psychometrical powers, for example,' smiled Jack but the inspector shook his head. "'I don't know enough about those to admire them. They seem uncanny to me, and yet in a certain way I can understand them. No, I'm thinking of other of his qualities.' He was suddenly silent, and Jack sensed his depression. "'You're having a pretty bad time at headquarters, aren't you?' he asked. "'I don't suppose they're particularly pleased with the immunity of the Crimson Circle?' Parr nodded. I'm not exactly in a bed of roses just now, he admitted, but that doesn't worry me a bit. He looked steadily at Jack. By the way, your young friend is in a new job. Jack started. My young friend? he stammered. You mean Miss... Miss Drummond, I mean. Derek Yale has engaged her, he chuckled softly at Jack's astonishment. Engaged Miss Thalia Drummond? You're joking, surely, said Jack. I thought he was joking when he suggested it. He's a queer bird, is Yale. He ought to be at headquarters, a lot of people think, said Jack, and realized that he had made a faux pas before the words were out. But if Mr. Parr was hurt, he did not show it. They don't take them in from outside, he said with a smile, and the inspector very rarely smiled. Otherwise, Mr. Beardmore, we should have taken you. No, our friend is clever. I suppose you don't expect a headquarters man to admit that what we call a fancy detective can be anything but an interfering fool. But Yale is clever. They had strolled together to the window, and were looking out into the sedate street in which Jack Beardmore's residence was situated. "'Isn't that Miss Drummond?' he asked suddenly. Parr had already seen her. She was walking slowly along the other side of the road, looking at the numbers of the houses. Presently she crossed. "'She's coming here,' gasped Jack. "'I wonder what—' He did not wait to finish what he had to say, but rushed out of the room and opened the hall door to her whilst her finger was lingering on the bell-push. "'It is good to see you, Thalia,' he said, gripping her warmly by the hand. "'Won't you come in? An old acquaintance of yours is in the dining-room.' She raised her eyebrows. "'Not Mr. Parr?' "'You're a wonderful guesser.' laughed Jack as he closed the door behind her. "'Did you want to see me alone?' he asked suddenly. She shook her head. "'No, I've only a message for you, from Mr. Yale. He wanted you to let him have the key of your riverside house.' By this time they were in the dining-room, and the girl, meeting the expressionless gaze of Mr. Parr, nodded curtly. "'You evidently do not love my friend, Mr. Parr,' thought Jack. He explained the object of the girl's visit. "'My poor father had a derelict property by the riverside,' he said. "'It has not been tenanted for years, and the surveyors tell me it will cost almost as much as the property is worth to put it into repair. For some reason, Yale thinks that Brabazon will use this as a hiding place. Brabazon had it in his hands for some time, trying to sell it. He looked after some of my father's property. But is he at all likely to be there?' Mr. Parr pursed his large lips and blinked meditatively. "'The only thing I know about him is that, so far, he has not left the country,' he said at last. 
I should not think he'd go to a house which he must know would be searched. He stared absently at Thalia. Yet he might, he mused. I suppose he has a key to the place. What is it, a house? It is half house and half warehouse, said Jack. I've never seen it, but I believe it is one of those dwellings which the old merchants favoured two hundred years ago, in the days when they lived in the places where they carried on business. He unlocked his desk and pulled out a drawer full of keys, each bearing a label. "'This is the one, I think, Miss Drummond,' he said, handing the key to her. "'How do you like your new job?' It required some courage to ask the question, for he was almost awe-stricken in her presence. She smiled faintly. "'It is amusing,' she said, "'without being in any way tempting. I cannot tell you very much about it, because I only started this morning.' She turned to the detective. "'No, I shan't trouble you very much, Mr. Parr,' she said. "'The only thing of value in the office is a silver paperweight. I don't even have to post the letters,' she went on mockingly. "'The office is built on the American plan, and there's a little chute in Mr. Yale's private office that drops the letters straight away into the box in the hall below. It is very disappointing.' Solemn though she was, her eyes were dancing with merriment. "'You're a queer woman, Thalia Drummond,' said Pa, "'and yet I'm sure there's some good in you.' The remark seemed to cause her unbounded amusement. She laughed until the tears were in her eyes, and Jack grinned sympathetically. Pa, on the other hand, showed no sign of amusement. "'Be careful,' he said ominously, and the smile faded from her lips. "'You may be sure I shall be very careful, Mr. Pa,' she said and if I am in any kind of trouble, you can be equally sure that I shall send immediately for you. "'I hope you will,' said Parr, "'though I have my doubts.'" End of section 8「Section 9 of The Crimson Circle by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter 21 River House Thalia went straight back to the office and found Derek Yale sitting in his room, reading through a heap of unanswered correspondence. "'Is that the key? Thank you. Put it down there,' he said. "'I am afraid you'll have to answer most of these yourself. The majority of them are from foolish young people who wish to be trained as private detectives. You will find a form reply, and you can sign the answers yourself.' And will you tell this lady, he handed a letter across to her, that I am so busy now that I cannot undertake any further commissions? He took up the key from the table and held it for a second on his hand. You saw Mr. Parr? She laughed. You were almost terrifying, Mr. Yale. I did see Mr. Parr, but how did you know? He shook his head smilingly. It is really very simple, and I should take no credit for my gift, he said any more than you take credit for your good looks and your predisposition to, shall I say, take things as you find them. She did not answer at once, then, I am a reformed character. I believe you will reform in time. You interest me, said Yale, and then, after a pause, immensely. And with a jerk of his head, he dismissed her. She was in the midst of her work, and her typewriter was clacking furiously when he appeared at the door of his room. "'Will you try to get Mr. Parr on the telephone?' he said. "'You'll we'll find his number on the register.' Mr. Parr was not in his office when she called, but half an hour later she reached him and switched through the wire to the next room. "'Is that you, Parr?' She heard his voice through the door, which was left ajar. "'I'm going to Beardmore's River property to make a search.' I have an idea that Brabazon may be hiding there. After lunch. All right. Will you be here at half-past two? Thalia Drummond listened and made a shorthand note on her blotting pad. At half-past two, Parr called. She did not see him, for there was a direct entrance to Yale's room from the corridor without, but she heard the rumble of his voice, and presently they went out. She waited until their footsteps had died away. Then she took a telegraph form and addressing it to Johnson, 23 Mildred Street, City, she wrote, Derek Yale has gone to search Beardmore's Riverside House. 
Thea Drummond was nothing if not dutiful. The house stood upon a little wharf, and was a picture of desolation and neglect. The stone foundation of the wharf was in decay, the parapet broken, the yard a wilderness of weed. Rank grasses and nettles formed almost an impenetrable barrier to their progress, after they had opened the gate which led from the mean east end street in which the wharfage was sited. The house itself might at one time have been picturesque, but now, with its broken lower windows, its weather-stained woodwork and discoloured walls, it was a pitiable piece of architectural wreckage. At one end was a big, gaunt stone stall, built flush with the war's edge, and apparently communicating with the house. An air raid during the war had demolished one corner of the wall, and robbed it of a few slates which remained, leaving the skeleton of rotting roof ribs nakedly bare to inspection. "'A cheerful place,' said Yale, as he opened the door. "'It is not the sort of setting in which one could imagine the elegant Brabazon, is it?' The passageway was dusty. Cobwebs hung from the ceiling, and the house was silent and lifeless. They made a rapid tour through the rooms, without, however, discovering any sign of the fugitive. "'There's a garret here,' said Yale, pointing to a flight of steps that led to a trap-door in the ceiling of the upper floor. He ran up the steps, pushed open the flap, and disappeared. Parr heard him walking along, and presently he came down. "'Nothing there,' he said, as he slammed the trap-door in its place. "'I never expected that you would find anything,' said Parr, as he led the way out of the house. They crossed the weed-grown path to the outer gate, and from a garret window a white-faced man watched them through the dusty glass. A man with a week's growth of beard, whom even his most intimate friends would never have recognized as Mr. Brabazon, the well-known banker. Chapter 22 The Messenger of the Circle "'You're a fool, sir, and an idiot. I thought you were a clever detective, but you're a fool!' Mr. Froyant was in his most savage mood, and the neat stack of banknotes which stood upon his desk supplied the reason. The sight of so much good money going away from him was a cause of unspeakable anguish to the miserly Harvey, and if his eyes strayed away from that accumulation of wealth, they came back again almost instantly. Derek Yale was a difficult man to offend. "'Perhaps I am,' he said. "'But I must run my own business in my own way, Mr. Froyant, and if I think that the girl can lead me to the Crimson Circle, as I do think, then I shall employ her.' "'Mark my words!' Froyant shook his fingers in the detective's face. "'That girl is with the gang. You will discover, my friend, that she is the messenger who will call for the money.' "'In which case she will be immediately arrested,' said the other. "'Believe me, Mr. Froyant, I have no intention of losing sight of these notes. But if they are taken by the Crimson Circle, the responsibility must be mine, not yours. My job is to save your life, and to divert the vengeance of the Circle from you to myself.' "'Quite right, quite right,' said Mr. Froyant, hastily. "'That is the proper way to look at it, Yale. I see that you are not as unintelligent as I thought. Have it your own way,' he said. He fingered the notes lovingly, and putting them into a long envelope, handed them, with every evidence of reluctance, to the detective, who slipped the package into his pocket. "'I suppose there is no news of Brabazon. The rascal has robbed me of over two thousand pounds.' which I foolishly invested in one of Marl's rotten concerns. "'Did you know anything about Marl?' asked the detective, opening the door. "'I only know that he was a blackguard.' "'Did you know anything that isn't as well known?' asked Yale, patiently. "'His beginnings, where he came from?' "'He came from France, I believe,' said Froyant. "'I know very little about him. In fact, it was James Beardmore who introduced me.' There was some story about his having been concerned in land swindles in France, and of having been imprisoned there. But I never take much notice of gossip. He was useful to me, and I made quite a considerable sum out of most of my investments with him. The other smiled. In those circumstances, he thought, the miser might very well forgive the erring moral for his later losses. When he got back to his office, he found Parr waiting with Jack Beardmore. He had not expected a visit from the younger man, and guessed that the real attraction was Thalia Drummond, for whose absence he tactfully apologized. 
"'I've sent Miss Drummond home, Pa,' he said. "'I don't want a girl mixed up in the business of this afternoon. There may be a little rough-and-tumble work.' He looked keenly at Jack Beardmore. "'For which I hope you are prepared.' "'I shall be disappointed if there isn't,' said Jack cheerfully. "'What is your plan?' asked Parr. "'I am going into my room a few minutes before the messenger is due to arrive. I shall have both doors locked, that into the passage and that into this outer office. In the case of this door, I will leave the key on your side and ask you to lock me in. My object, of course, is to prevent a surprise. As soon as you hear a knock and hear me rise and go to the door and unlock it, you will know that the visitor has arrived, and when the door closes again, I want you to station yourself outside in the corridor. Parr nodded. That seems simple, he said. He walked to the window, looked out, and waved the handkerchief, and Yale smiled approvingly. I see you've taken the necessary precautions. How many men have you? I think there are eighty, said Mr. Parr calmly, and they will practically surround the place. Yale nodded. We have to remember, he said, that the Crimson Circle may send a very ordinary district messenger, in which case, of course, he must be followed. I'm determined that the money shall pass into the hands of the chief of the Crimson Circle himself. That is an essential. I quite agree, said Pa. But I have an idea that the gentleman, or whoever he is, will not come himself. May I look at your office? He walked in and inspected the room. It was lighted by one window. In a corner was a cupboard, the door of which he opened. It was empty, save for a hanging coat. If you don't mind, Inspector Parr was almost humble. I want you to stay in the outer office. Thank you. I'll close the door on you. I get rattled if I'm overlooked. Laughingly, Yale walked from the office, and Mr. Parr closed the door on him. He opened the second door and looked out into the corridor. Presently, they heard him close that also. You can come in, he said. I've seen all I want. The room was simply but comfortably furnished. There was a wide fireplace, in which, however, no fire burned, although the day was chilly. "'I don't expect him to get up the chimney,' said Yale, humorously, as he noticed the detective's inspection. "'I never have a fire in this office. I'm one of those hot-blooded mortals who are never really cold.' Jack, a fascinated observer of the search, picked up the deadly little pistol that lay on the detective's table, and examined it cautiously. "'Be careful. That trigger is a little sensitive,' said Yale. He took from his pocket the envelope containing the notes, and laid it by the side of the weapon. Then he looked at his watch. "'Now I think that, to be on the safe side, we should go to the other office and lock the door,' he said. He accompanied his words by locking the door into the corridor. "'It is rather thrilling,' whispered Jack. He felt that a whisper was the fitting tone for that exciting moment." "'I hope it won't be too thrilling,' said Yale. They went to the outer office, and turned the key on him, and sat down. Jack, unconsciously, on Thalia Drummond's chair, a fact which he realised with a start. Was she of the Crimson Circle, he wondered? Parr had hinted as much. Jack set his teeth. He could not, and would not believe even the evidence of his own eyes and his own common sense." So far from her influence waning, it was gathering strength. She was a being apart, and if she was guilty... He looked up, and saw Parr's eyes fixed upon him. "'I don't pretend to be psychometrical,' said the detective slowly. "'But I've an idea you're thinking about Thalia Drummond.' "'I was,' admitted the young man. "'Mr. Parr, do you think she's really as bad as she appears to be?' "'Do you mean... Do I think that she stole Froyant's Buddha? Because if that's what you mean, it's not a question of thinking. I'm certain. Jack was silent. He could never hope to convince this stolid man of the girl's innocence, and anyway it was madness, he recognized, to think of her as innocent when she had confessed her fault. You'd better keep quiet in there. It was Yale's voice, and Parr grunted a reply. Thereafter they sat in dead silence. They heard him moving about the room, then he too was quiet, for the hour was approaching. 
Inspector Parr pulled his watch from his pocket and laid it on the table. The hands pointed to half-past three. It was now that the messenger was due, and he sat, his head strained forward, listening. But there was no sound of attack. Presently there was a noise in Yale's room, a queer bumping noise, as though Yale had sat down heavily. Parr jumped to his feet. What was that? It's all right, said Yale's voice. I stumbled over something. Be quiet. They sat for another five minutes, and then Parr called. Are you all right, Yale? There was no answer. Yale, he called more loudly. Do you hear me? There was no reply, and springing to the door, he snapped the lock and rushed into the room, Jack at his heels. What he saw might have paralyzed even a more experienced officer than Inspector Parr. Stretched upon the ground, his wrists fastened with handcuffs, his ankles strapped, and a towel over his face, lay the prostrate figure of Derek Yale. The window was open, and there was a strong scent of ether and chloroform. The package of money which had laid upon the table had disappeared. Three seconds later, an aged postman left the hall of the building, carrying his letter-bag on his shoulder, and the police who were watching the house let him pass without question. Chapter 23 The Woman in the Cupboard Parr bent down and snatched the saturated towel from the detective's face, and he opened his eyes and stared around. "'What is it?' he asked thickly, but the inspector was busy unscrewing the handcuffs. Presently he threw them clanking to the floor and lifted the man to his feet, as Jack, with trembling fingers, unbuckled the straps about Yale's legs. They led him to his chair, and he fell heavily into its depths, passing his hand across his forehead. "'What happened?' he asked. "'That's what I'd like to know,' said Parr. "'Which way did they go?' The other shook his head. "'I don't know. I can't remember,' he said. "'Is the door locked?' Jack ran to the door. The key was turned from the inside. He could not have gone that way, but the window was open. That was the first thing Parr had seen when he entered the room. He ran to the window and looked out. There was a sheer fall of eighty feet and no sign of a ladder or of any means by which Yale's assailant could have escaped. "'I don't know what happened,' said Yale, when he had partially recovered. "'I was sitting in this chair when suddenly a cloth was pulled across my face, and two powerful hands gripped me with a strength which I shouldn't have thought possible in any human being. Before I could struggle or cry out, I must have lost consciousness.' "'Did you hear my call?' asked Parr. The other man shook his head. "'But, Mr. Yale, we heard a noise, and Mr. Parr asked if you were all right. You replied that you had only stumbled.' "'It was not me,' said Yale. "'I remember nothing from the moment the cloth was put on my face until the moment you found me here.' Inspector Parr was at the window. He pulled down the sash, and he pushed it up again, and then he looked on the window sill and when he turned, there was a large smile on his face. "'That is the cleverest thing I've ever seen,' he said. Something of Jack's old antipathy to the stout detective returned. "'I don't think it's particularly clever. They've half killed Yale, and they've got away,' he said. "'I said it was clever, and it was clever,' said Mr. Parr, stolidly. "'And now I think I'll go down and interview the officers I left on duty in the hall.' but the watching officers had nothing to say. Nobody had entered or left the building except the postman. "'Except the postman, eh?' said Parr thoughtfully. "'Why, of course, the postman. "'All right, Sergeant, you can dismiss your man.' He went up in the elevator and rejoined Yale. "'The money's gone, all right,' he said. "'I don't know what we can do except report the matter to headquarters.' Yale was now nearly his normal self, and sat at his desk, with his head resting on his hands. "'Well, I'm the culprit this time,' he said, "'and they can't blame you, Parr. I'm still trying to puzzle out how they got into that window, and how they reached me without making a sound.' "'Was your back to the window?' Yale nodded. "'I never jumped at the window. I sat so that I could see both doors.' Your back was also to the fireplace. 
"'They couldn't have come that way,' said the other, shaking his head. "'No, this is the supreme mystery of my career, more astounding than the identity of the Crimson Circle.' He got up slowly. "'I must report this to old man Froyant, and you'd better come along and lend me your moral support,' he said. "'He will be furious.' They left the office together, Yale locking both doors and slipping the key into his pocket. To say that Mr. Froyant was furious is to employ a very mild expression to describe his hectic frenzy. "'You told me! You practically promised me!' he stormed, that the money would come back to me, and now you've come with a cock-and-bull story of being drugged. It is monstrous. Where were you, Parr? I was on the premises, said Mr. Parr, and the story Mr. Yale has told is correct. Suddenly, Froyant's rage died down, so suddenly that the calmness of his voice was almost startling after its previous rancor. All right, he said. Nothing can be done. The Crimson Circle have had their money, and that is the end of it. I'm much obliged to you, Yale. Please send your bill to me. And with these brusque instructions, he sent them to rejoin Jack, who was waiting in the street outside. Well, that beats the band, said Parr. I thought at one time he was going to have a fit. And then did you notice how his manner changed? Yale nodded slowly. At the moment of Froyant's change of manner, a great idea was formed in his mind, a tremendous and startling doubt that was almost paralyzing. "'And now,' said Parr, good-humouredly, "'as I have given you moral support, perhaps you will extend the same service to me. At police headquarters I am not so much persona grata as you. Come along and see the commissioner and tell him what happened.' Derek Yale's office was silent and deserted. Ten minutes had passed since the drone of the elevator announced the departure of the three men. The silence was broken by a click, and slowly the doors and the big cupboard in the corner of Derek Yale's office were pushed open, and Thalia Drummond came out. She closed the doors behind her, and stood for a while, contemplating the room, deep in thought. From her pocket she took a key, opened the door, and, passing into the corridor, locked the door behind her. She did not ring for the elevator. At the farther end of the passage was a flight of narrow stairs which communicated with the caretaker's room on the top floor, and which were used only by him. Down these she went. At the bottom was a door leading into the courtyard of a building. This, too, she unlocked, and soon after had joined the throng of homeward-bound clerks that thronged the pavement at this hour. End of section 9。section 10 of The Crimson Circle by Edgar Wallace。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Anna Simon。Chapter 24 。Ten thousand pounds reward。The Associated Merchants Bank are authorized to offer a reward of ten thousand pounds for information which will lead to the arrest and conviction of the leader of what is known as the Crimson Circle Gang. In conjunction with this reward, the Secretary of State promises a free pardon to any member of the gang, other than one actually guilty of willful murder, providing that the said member will furnish the information and evidence requisite to the conviction of the man or woman known as the Crimson Circle. On every hoarding, in every post office window, on every police station board, the announcement flared in blood-red print. Derek Yale, on his way to his office, saw the announcement and read it and passed on, wondering what effect this would have upon the minor members of the gang he had been engaged to hunt. Thalia Drummond read it from the top of a bus when that vehicle had pulled up close to a hoarding to take on a passenger, and she smiled to herself but the most remarkable effect of the poster was upon Harvey Froyant. It brought a colour to his face and a light to his eye which made him almost youthful. He, too, was on his way to the office when he read the announcement, but hurried back to his house and took from a drawer in his study a long list. 
They were the numbers of the banknotes which the Crimson Circle had taken, and he had compiled them laboriously, almost lovingly. With his own hands he now made another copy, a work that occupied him until late in the morning. When he had finished, he wrote a letter, and enclosing the new list of notes, he addressed it, posting the letter himself, to a firm of lawyers which he knew specialised the tracing of lost and stolen property. Haggitz had rendered him good service before, and the next morning brought a representative of the firm, Mr. James Haggitt, the senior partner, a widened little man with a chronic sniff. The name of Haggitt was not one which was universally respected, nor did lawyers, when they met, speak of it with affection or regard. And yet it was one of the most prosperous firms of lawyers in the city. The majority of its clients were on or over the borderline which separates the lawful from the unlawful, but to the law-abiding also it was very useful, and was frequently consulted by more eminent firms whose clients wished to recover valuable goods which had been taken by the light-fingered gentry. In some mysterious way Haggitts could always place their finger upon a gentleman who had heard of the property which was lost, and in the majority of cases the missing article was restored. "'I got your note, Mr. Fryant,' said the little lawyer, "'and I can tell you now that none of these notes are likely to go through the usual channels.' He paused and licked his lips, looking past Mr. Fryant. "'The biggest fence of all has gone, so I'm not doing him any injustice when I mention the fact. <laughs> "'Who is that?' "'Rabazon,' was the startling reply and the other stared at him in astonishment. "'You don't mean Brabazon of Brabazon's bank?' "'Yes, I do,' said Haggett, nodding. "'I should say he did a bigger business in stolen money than any other man in London. <laughs> you see, it could pass through his bank without anybody being the wiser, and as he did a lot of business abroad, and was constantly changing and rechanging money for export.' He got away with it. We knew who was fencing it. At least, when I say we knew, he corrected himself, we had a shrewd suspicion. As officers of the court, we should, of course, have notified the authorities had we been certain. I thought it better to call to explain to you that it's going to be a very difficult job to trace this money. Most stolen notes are passed on race courses but quite a considerable number find their way abroad, where it is a much simpler matter to change them, and where they are ever so much more difficult to trace. You say it was the Crimson Circle who did it? Do you know them? asked Froyan quickly. The lawyer shook his head. I have never had any dealings with them at all, he said, but of course I knew about them, and enough to know that they are clever people. It is likely that this man Brabazon has been doing their work, consciously or unconsciously. In that case, they might find a difficulty in disposing of the stuff. For a banknote, fence is one of the hardest to find. What am I to do when I track one of these notes and have discovered the person who passed it? I want you to notify me at once, said Froyant, and nobody else. You understand that this is a matter on which my life may hang, and if by any chance the Crimson Circle get to know that I am trying to recover the money, it will be a very serious thing for me. The lawyer agreed. The Crimson Circle apparently interested him, for he lingered and skilfully plied his employer with questions without Mr. Froyant realising that he was being pumped. There is something new in criminals, he said. In Italy where the black hand thrives, the demand for money, followed by a threat of death, is quite a common occurrence, but I should not have thought it possible in this country. The most amazing thing of all is that the Crimson Circle holds together. I should imagine, he said thoughtfully, that there is only one man in it, and that he employs a very considerable number of people unknown to one another and each having his particular job to perform. Otherwise he would have been betrayed a long time ago. It is only the fact that the people serving him 
do not know him that makes it possible for him to carry on. He took up his hat. By the way, did you know Felix Marl? A client of ours is under charge of burgling his house. Mr. Barnett. You may not have heard of him. Mr. Froyant had not heard of Flush Barnett, but he knew Marl, and Marl interested him almost as much as the Crimson Circle interested the lawyer. I knew Marl. Why do you ask? The lawyer smiled. A strange character, he said. A remarkable character in many ways. He was a member of the gang engaged in frauds on French banks. I suppose you didn't know that. His lawyer came to see me today. Apparently, a Mrs. Marl has turned up to claim his property, and she has told us the whole story. He and a man named Lightman made a fortune in France until they were caught. Marl would have been sent to the guillotine, only he turned state's evidence. Lightman, I believe, went to the knife. "'What a charming man Mr. Marl must have been,' said Mr. Froyant, ironically. The little lawyer smiled. "'What charming people we all are when our lives are laid bare,' he said. And Mr. Froyant resented the implied censure, for it was his boast that his life was a book. He might have added, in truth, a bank book. So Brabazon was a dealer in stolen notes, and Marl a convicted murderer. Mr. Froyant wondered how Marl managed to escape from his term of imprisonment, which must have been a severe one, and he inwardly rejoiced that his business relationships with the deceased had not ended even more disastrously than they had. He dressed and went to his club to dine, and his car was running into Pall Mall when a hoarding poster showed under the light of a lamp and reminded him of the unpleasant fact that he was a fifty thousand pounds poorer man that night than he had been in the morning. Ten thousand reward, he muttered. Bah! Who is going to turn King's evidence? I don't suppose even Brabazon would dare. But he did not know Brabazon. Chapter 25 The Tenant of River House Mr. Brabazon sat in a chill upper room of River House, eating slowly a large portion of bread and cheese. He wore the dress suit he was wearing when the warning came to him, and he was a ludicrous figure in the smartly fitting but now soiled and dusty garb. His white shirt was grey with the grime of the house. He was colourless, and his general air of dissipation was heightened by the stubbly beard that decorated his face. He finished his repast, opened the window carefully, and threw out the remnants of bread. And, passing through the trap-door, he descended the ladder and made his way to the big kitchen at the back of the house. He had neither soap nor towel, but he made some attempt to wash himself without their aid, utilizing one of the two handkerchiefs he had brought with him to the house in his flight. With the exception of the clothes he stood up in, an overcoat and the soft felt hat he had seized when he made his escape, he was quite unequipped for this undesirable adventure. The provisions which the mystery man had brought the night after he had reached his hiding place were almost exhausted. He had spent twenty-four hours without any food whatever, but in his agitation had not realized the fact until the stranger arrived, carrying a basket of foodstuffs. As to his nerves, they were almost gone. A week spent in that hovel without communion with man, with the knowledge that the police were searching for him, and that a long term of imprisonment would automatically follow his capture, had played havoc with his placid features, and to the solitude had been added the terror of a search. He had shrunk in a corner behind a door which opened to the inner room leading to the garret, whilst the detective had explored the room. The memory of Derrick Yale's visit was a nightmare. He settled himself down in the old chair that he had found in the house to spend yet another night. The man whose warning had sent him flying to cover must come soon and must bring more food. Brabazon was dozing when he heard the sound of a key put into the lock below and jumped up. He tiptoed carefully to the trapdoor and lifted it, and then he heard the booming voice of the stranger. "'Come down,' it said, and he obeyed. The previous interview had been in the passage where the darkness seemed thicker than anywhere else in the house. 
he had accustomed himself to the darkness and walked down the rickety stairs without mishap stay where you are said the voice i have brought you some food and clothing you will find everything you need you had better shave yourself and make yourself presentable where am i going asked brabazon i have taken a berth for you on a steamer leaving victoria dock to-morrow for new zealand you will find your passport papers and ticket in the grip now listen you are to leave your moustache or what there is of it unshaven and shave your eyebrows they are the most conspicuous features of your face brabazon wondered when this man had seen him mechanically his hand stole up to his shaggy eyebrows and mentally he agreed with the mysterious visitor i have not brought you any money the voice went on you have sixty thousand which you stole from marl you closed his account forging his name to his check believing that i would settle with him as i did who are you asked brabazon i am the crimson circle was the reply why do you ask that question you have met me before yes of course brabazon muttered i think this place is driving me mad when may i leave this house you may leave to-morrow wait until nightfall your ship leaves on the following morning but you can get on board to-morrow night but they will be watching the ship pleaded brabazon don't you think it is too dangerous there is no danger for you was the reply give me your money my money gasped the banker turning pale give me your money there was an ominous note in the voice that spoke in the darkness and tremblingly brabazon obeyed two large packets of money passed into the gloved hand of the visitor and then here take this this was a thinner wad of notes and the sensitive fingers of the banker told him that they were new you can change them when you get abroad said the man couldn't i leave tonight brabazon's teeth were chattering now this place gives me the horrors the crimson circle was evidently thinking for it was some time before he spoke if you wish he said but remember you are taking a risk now go upstairs the order was sharp and peremptory and meekly brabazon obeyed he heard the door close and peering through the dusty windows he saw the dark shadow stalk along the path and disappear into the darkness presently he heard the gate click the man was gone brabazon groped for the bag which the other had left and finding it carried it to the kitchen here he could show a light without fear of detection and he lit one of the scraps of candle he had discovered in his search of the house during the week the stranger had not exaggerated when he said that the bag contained all that brabazon required but the banker's first thought was to examine the money which the other had put into his hand they were notes of all series and all numbers his own had been in a series and yet they were new he looked at them curiously he knew that new banknotes were not usually issued higgledy-piggledy and then he guessed the reason the crimson circle had blackmailed somebody and had asked that the notes should not be numbered consecutively he put the money down and began to change it was a very smart brabazon who stepped cautiously through the gates carrying his bag an hour later and yet so remarkable was the change which the shaved eyebrows had made that when at eleven o'clock that night he passed one of the many detective officers who were looking for him he was unrecognized he had engaged a room in a small hotel near euston station and went to bed it was the first night of untroubled sleep he had enjoyed for over a week the next day he spent in his room not caring to trust himself abroad in daylight but in the evening after a solitary meal served in a sitting-room he went out to take the air he was gaining in confidence and was now satisfied that he could pass the scrutiny of the ship detective he chose the less frequented streets and was passing near the museum when he saw a bill newly pasted on the hoarding and stopped to read it as he read an idea took shape ten thousand pounds and a free pardon 
it was by no means sure that he would escape in the morning more likely was it that he would be detected and at best what would his life be the life of a hunted dog for which even his money would not compensate him ten thousand pounds and freedom and nobody knew about the money that he tricked from felix marl's estate he would put that in a safe deposit in the morning go straight to police headquarters with information which he felt sure must lead to the crimson circle's undoing i'll do it he said aloud i think you're very wise the voice was at his elbow and he swung round a little stocky man had walked noiselessly behind him in his rubber-soled shoes and brabazon recognized him instantly inspector pa he gasped that's right said the inspector now mr brabazon will you come a little walk with me or are you going to make trouble as they went into the police station a woman came out and the pallid brabazon failed to recognize his former clerk he stood in the steel pen whilst the story of his iniquities was told in the cold official language of the warrant you can save yourself a lot of trouble mr brabazon said inspector pa by telling me the truth i know where you're staying at bright's hotel on the euston road you arrived there late last night and your passage is booked in the name of thompson to new zealand by the isinger which is due to leave victoria dock tomorrow morning good god said the startled brabazon how did you know that but here inspector pa did not inform him brabazon did not intend lying he told everything he knew all that had happened from the moment he was called by telephone and told to make a getaway until he was arrested so you were in the house all the time said the inspector thoughtfully how did you come to escape mr yale's search oh was it yale said brabazon i thought it was you there was an inner room just a little storehouse i think it was in the old times i got behind the door and hid he came almost to the door i nearly died with fright so yale was right again you were there said the inspector speaking half to himself now what are you going to do about it brabazon i'm going to tell you all i know about the crimson circle and i think i can give you information which will lead to his arrest but you'll have to be smart he was recovering something of his old pomposity parr observed i told you that he exchanged my notes for his and his notes for mine i'm sure he did that because he was afraid of the numbers being taken but my notes were in a series series e nineteen and i can give you the number of every one of them he went on easily he wouldn't change the stuff he got that was froyant's money i think said the inspector yes go on he dare not change that but he will change mine don't you see what a chance this gives to you the inspector was a little sceptical nevertheless after brabazon had been locked in the cell he called up froyant on the phone and told him as much of what had happened as was necessary for him to know you've got the money said froyant eagerly come up to the house at once i'll bring it up to the house with pleasure replied pa but i feel i ought to warn you that this is not your money although it is the actual cash that was transferred by you to the crimson circle later on in mr froyant's presence he explained the situation that spare man made no attempt to hide his disappointment for he seemed to think that in whatever circumstances the money was recovered he was entitled to claim after a while inspector parr got him into a more reasonable frame of mind froyant was talking quite calmly on the matter when he suddenly broke off with the question have you the numbers of the notes which brabazon handed to him they are easy to remember said parr they belong to a series and he recited the numbers mr froyant making a rapid note on his desk-pad End of section 10